stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. City Clerk, will you please take roll? Mayor Moore. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Sestarsic. Here. Council Member Vera Papa. Here. Council Member Kalmick. Council Member Vera Papa. Here. Here. Council Member Kalmick. Here. Council Member Masalabit. Here. We have a quorum. Okay. Thanks. Move to approval of the agenda. By motion of the City Council, this is the time to notify the public of any changes to the agenda or rearrange the order of the agenda. Does anyone want to pull a consent calendar item? Mayor, I have one request um, from staff. Um, as all of you know, we uh, made a request of the Orange County Water District based on um, an article that appeared in the LA Times last week regarding um, water. If they would come tonight and just address the council and community um, on that program, I believe, and I apologize if I pronounce his name wrong, Jane, Jason, Dadakis, Executive Director of Water Quality Technical Resources here from Orange County Water District. So my request would be um, if we add that under presentations and if we could take that item first, I'd appreciate it. Okay, no problem. Thank you. City Clerk, do we have any supplemental communications? Yes, Mayor. Five communications were received regarding various agenda items that were distributed to the City Council and has been made available to the public. Thanks. And is there a motion to approve the agenda? I move mean, we approve the agenda. Second. <laughs> okay, verb. It's too early. Let's do verbal. Oh, it's, it's Eyes. High. Okay, got it. All right. It's approved. And we'll move on to presentations, and I'll call upon Jason Dadakis, Executive Director of Water and Quality and Technical Resources, uh, to give an Orange County Water District update. Great. Uh, thank you, Mayor Moore, members of the council, uh, staff, and residents. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight to give you folks an update uh, on this important issue in the Orange County groundwater basin, uh, and also in Seal Beach. Um, so just very briefly where I'm from, the agency, I'm from Orange County Water District. Um, we're formed in 1933. We're here to manage the groundwater basin on your behalf and the behalf of the other producing city, cities and entities in the basin. Um, we've been around since 1933. We also protect the county's rights to the Santa Ana River surface flows. Um, so essentially you can think of us, we're kind of like the groundwater wholesaler that cities like Seal Beach who pump from the basin. We work very closely with the cities in the basin to manage the resource responsibly. Um, 2.5 million service, uh, people in our service area, you see from the map here, we're really in the north and central portion of Orange County, basically from Irvine to the county line up here uh, near Los Angeles. Um, 2.5 million area, uh, residents in the service area, and Seal Beach is one of 19 major retail water districts that we work very closely with. Um, the basin currently provides Seal Beach and other cities 77% uh, of their local water supply here. Uh, with the balance being imported from either Northern California or the Colorado River through the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. Um, so, as was mentioned, there was a recent article in the LA Times this week. Uh, it appeared uh, online on Tuesday. It was actually also in the Sunday uh, hard copy edition, um, which spoke about um, toxic plume of firefighting foam, uh, firefighting foam affecting areas around the state, um, and had a quote in here about a, a military contractor um, basically saying that using groundwater for drinking water near Los Alamitos may, um, may potentially be exposed to, to migrating PFAS contamination. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of background on that in, in terms of our understanding of, of where that article was coming from on that point. Um, so we can talk about PFAS. Um, it's a little bit of a mouthful, but so it's an acronym PFAS. Uh, it stands for PER and polyfluoroalkyl alkyl substances. Um, this is a family of hundreds, if not thousands, of different chemicals that all have the basic chemical structure you see up there on the screen. So basically a, uh, a, um, an atom, uh, a molecule that has a chain of carbon atoms is primarily standard by fluorines, fluorine atoms. And the real property that gives these molecules is that that carbon-fluorine bond um, is very, very strong. It's one of the strongest ones in nature. And so it makes these compounds very resilient, gives them a lot of the properties we like to have, they don't break down, uh, but at the same time they're very recalcitrant once they're released in the environment. 
And so that's, that's sort of the issue with them. And then the two compounds listed at the bottom there, uh, PFOA and PFOS, are two of the most well-studied members of that family, um, and the ones that we know the most about in terms of environmental and health effects. So I'll, most of my remarks will be about, about those two compounds within the PFAS family tonight. Um, so these, these compounds are used across a wide range of industries and consumer products. Um, really, they're there for their oil, stain, and water-resistant properties. That's what they're really good at. Um, so things like carpets are treated with them, so that like things like Stainmaster uh, and Scotchgard use them to keep stains from setting. Um, they're used in food containers to keep the grease from soaking through in your maybe your fast casual bowl or your wrapper for your, your hamburger. Um, they're used in waterproofing, like things like Gore-Tex contain them, um, waterproof boots. Uh, the manufacture of Teflon, like a non-stick pan. Um, even found in certain, a certain brand of dental floss actually uses it because they'll slide through your teeth better. Um, and then also there's some industrial uses as well. Um, the firefighting foams picked up shown on the upper right there. Um, these compounds are very good when mixed um, with, a, with sort of a, a soapy mixture. They're very good at putting out a jet fuel fire very quickly because they're so, they're so strong, right? They won't break down under the intense heat of the fire. And so that, that's why they found their use at military area fields uh, around the world and at municipal airports as well for that property. Um, and finally, the last picture there, chrome, chrome plating. They're also used in that, that industry as well. So why we're here tonight really is that, that, that fire floating foam use. Um, that, um, that, um, and so this is just a picture here from the Associated Press, actually at a, an installation in Dover, Delaware. Um, it's a C5 Galaxy plane that had crashed there about 10 years ago. And you can see how the plane is doused in this foam to prevent a, a fire from occurring. So switching to Seal Beach. Um, so the city has four, uh, four municipal water supply wells. They're, they're the red dots you see there on the bottom. Um, with the designations of SB LEI, that's for, for Leisure World, SB Bev for Beverly, SB Lamb for Lampson, and SB BC for Bolsa Chica. So those are the four wells that the city has that the city uses to uh, access its groundwater supply. Um, and you can see the, the Los Alamitos Joint Forces Training Base is just, just to the north of where those wells are located. Um, the one well up on the, the top there, the LEM one well, um, that's a well the Orange County Water District uh, um, runs. It's a regional monitoring well. It's a place where we use to test the quality and measure the pressures in the underground aquifer system for our regional assessments. So we'll, we have some results from there we'll share with you tonight. Um, so if we just take a quick little line through, the, through three of the city's wells there, we're going to draw a little slice through the earth and we can see kind of what's underground. We have some information on that based on information from those wells and our regional understanding of the geology. So we'll do, a little, we'll do what's called a cross section and you'll get to see what's underground. So you can see to the left, to the southwest, it's the Pacific Ocean here. And then you can see the two wells right together, the Leisure World and the Beverly Well. Um, and then you can see the Lampson and then a projection of the Bolsa Chica well. And so the first thing I want to point out here, these wells are fairly deep. Um, they access some of the deeper aquifers that we manage at Orange County Water District. Um, these wells are approaching at least 400 feet deep for the, the beginning of their screens and then down to nearly over 1,000 feet in some cases. So they produce water over a wide interval. Uh, and a relatively, you can tell, a relatively protected portion of the basin. The layers that are shown there are layers of sand and gravel. Those are the, the light colored lines. The dark colored layers are layers of silt and clay that are not as permeable. And so it really limits infiltration of water from the surface in this portion of the basin near the coast. Um, and so from that perspective, steel beaches wells are relatively protected from surface contamination. Um, so that's an important point to remember. So the steel beach wells have been tested for these PFAS chemicals that are known to occur in the aqueous film forming foams that are used in these bases. Uh, it was back in 2013. This was required testing by federal EPA. They had a program called the Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule. Um, and it required six individual PFAS compounds, including PFOA and PFS, be tested. Um, and so our laboratory at the Water District has the capability to do this testing. We provide the water quality testing for Seal Beach and all the cities in Orange County for their groundwater supplies. And the testing locations that were included were the Bolsa Chica well, the Lampson well, and then the reservoir, the Beverly Manor Reservoir, where the Leisure World well and the Beverly well mix together. Okay? So those were the required sampling points. And the bottom take-home message is based on that testing, none of these compounds were detected in the groundwater supply based on that testing at that time. Okay? And we provide that information to the city, to the state, and to EPA. Um, so shifting gears now, just shift what we know at the water district about the testing that's going on on the base itself. Um, so first, the first setup there, testing has been performed by the Army National Guard contractor. Um, 
under, on basically under the state's regulatory authority. The state has been working with them to try to figure out, has there been a release there at, at the base, um, knowing that like many military fields, it was likely that the, the fire floating foams were used for practice and training activities. Um, so the, the National Guard has tested four old unused wells on the base. These are old wells that were previously, this, the, the base had its own water system, um, but subsequently they converted over and take municipal water now. So these base were just, these old wells are just kind of sitting there, kind of left over, unused, but not, not destroyed or sealed or abandoned. So they went around and, and based on a national program, they did some testing of those wells. Um, interestingly, those wells don't have their own pump present like, like the city of Seal Beach's wells do. So the contractor bring a little small little pump in and try to pump some water out of them and, um, and collected samples from them. We have some questions about how represented those samples were given the small volume water that was pour, pulled out of this, this big old sort of irrigation or, or supply well, um, and as well as um, even the depth of these wells. We don't have very good records given the age of these wells, how deep they are, which aquifer is providing water to them, and even just the integrity of them. Uh, we know at least one of the wells is over 100 years old, and wells of that age can have integrity issues such that water may be coming in at shallower intervals than it was originally designed. So we don't have a really good sense of that, and we're trying to work with the Army on that. Uh, next testing we've done by the Water District, um, there are actually four additional wells on the base that are used for irrigation now. The Army leases some of the land out for, for, to farmers there for irrigation. And, um, and so we've, been, we've um, been able to test those wells, so we have da I can data I can share with you for that. Um, but we, don't have, again, don't have very good rec records on what the depth of those wells are. The one location on the base where we do have good depth information is our well, that LEM one well I showed you on that first slide. Um, we have very good depth information. They actually have data at about 10 different depths going down through the aquifer layers. And so I'll show that to you as well. And finally, as I start showing you some numbers here, just one thing to keep in mind, we do have some current drinking water advisory levels for these compounds, uh, specifically for PFOA and PFS. It's currently 70 nanograms per liter or parts per trillion. Um, just to put a little bit of context, um, if you dissolve four grains of sugar in an Olympic-sized swimming pool, that's equivalent to one nanogram of sugar in that volume of pool. Um, I've heard it said if you, if you travel to the moon, um, back and forth, round trip, 33 round trips, that distance, and the sort of the equivalent of a nanogram is one inch of that distance. So it's a very small, small quantity that um, we have chemical techniques we can measure um, for this, uh, measure very precisely, but we're talking about very small quantities. Um, so, th these, so the health advisory, both by US EPA, um, called the Lifetime Health Advisory, and what in California the state regulators call a response level, Basically, if a water supply tests above that 70 combined standard, it is, it is recommended that the water not be served to the public. It's not an enforceable regulation yet, both, although both EPA and the state are moving towards an enforceable standard. But basically, water utilities like Seal Beach basically interpret this advisory as if it was enforceable and essentially will shut their wells off if it succeeded. So here's a little uh, aerial photo of the base. You can see some wells on the base here. These are the wells where the Army National Guard did their testing. And you can see the city's Lampton Well just to the south of the base there. So I'll show you the results from the Army National Guard testing. Um, you can see there in the upper, sort of the northwest corner of the base, um, they did have a detection in two of their wells there. Um, one, well to the left, the upper left there, did have a result above that health advisory. Uh, the other two wells, LA-5 and LARA, also had detections but are below that state standard. The well the closest to the south, the well closest to the Lampson well, was non-detect. These compounds were not detected there, okay? So this is what we know from the Na National Guard's testing on the base. This is now turning to our testing on the base we've done with the Water District. So you can see our well here up on the corner, LAM1. We have multiple independent depths we can test. It's a very highly specialized well made for, really for just testing water quality at discrete depths. So we've tested all these depths in this well and have not detected these contaminants. Uh, in this location, and we're going to continue our monitoring there. We turn to the irrigation wells used at the base there. Uh, three of them, we did not have a detection. One, there was a detection just above the detection. Our lab can reliably detect, this, detect these right around four nanograms per liter. So we had one low, low, low detection there. Again, don't have great depth information on those irrigation wells. That's something we're going to seek to work with, on the, Navy, with, with the Army to get a better understanding of. So as a follow-up to this, uh, the Army has taken this information and they're actually conducting a follow-up investigation at the base. Um, it's actually supposed to begin actually next week, um, and they're going to put, do additional soil and groundwater testing at eight areas of investigation. Basically, these are, these are crash, uh, fire, and rescue testing areas, basic areas where they handled the foam, tested the foam, 
You look in the upper right there, that emergency response location, uh, AOI number eight, that's actually where they had a plane on fire, and they actually doused the plane there and they recorded that in their record, so they're gonna do an investigation there. So based on their sort of an audit of their sites and the data they've collected so far, they're gonna start looking and do a focus investigation to try to understand the extent of any contamination in soil and in groundwater. And again, that's supposed to start next week under regulatory oversight from the state of California. So next steps, um, you know, at the Water District, our plan is to monitor and coordinate um, that investigation that the Army's doing, work closely with the state regulators to make sure it is thorough. Um, we think it's a reasonable step to do that investigation given what they saw in the on-site wells. Um, we want to determine the depths and integrity of any of those old on-site wells because we want to make sure none of them are being a conduit for the water getting down into the potable aquifers that are used. So we, we want to make sure that that's assessed. And finally, um, in speaking with the Public, work, public Works Department, um, the city has requested that the water district do follow-on testing of the city's wells uh, to confirm the non-detects that we had um, when we did the testing previously. And so the water district is pre prepared to do that um, within the next few weeks with our testing program. Uh, and with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to take any, any questions from the council. Uh, you're talking about uh, getting, uh, working with the Army. Mm -hmm. Is it the U.S. Army or the Army Corps? What army? Right. Um, it, is, it is the division of, of the U.S. US Army. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They have jurisdiction over a joint forces base that's run by California? Right. They do. The Army National Guard is sort of the lead agency overseeing that and the one folks we've been interacting with on, on this. And they're the, they're the lead on the investigation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? I, the the our wells are are tested for general generally weekly, but for PFAs, how often are they tested? Yeah, that's a good question. So there's um, so there was that one time federal program back in 2013, which was requirement to test, and since then there's not been a requirement, a regulatory requirement to test for them, um, and even today there's not. But I think in speaking with the Public Works Department, given what we know now, know at the base, it would probably prudent to go ahead and have the wells be retested. Thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I think we just want to know if our water is safe to drink. That's, that's sure. Uh, safe to say? Yeah, ba based on the information we collected today, okay. we're meeting all state and federal standards, um, but we're, you know, we're certainly continuing our monitoring there, and I, I think it is a prudent step to go ahead and continue the monitoring. Just to clarify, the chemical wasn't found in any Seal Beach uh, wells, correct? That is correct. Our testing to date is not shown at any of Seal Beach's wells. Thank you. Thank you. And and just <laughs> just repeat again, we their wells on base could be shallower, so they could be picking up. But because our wells are deep, mm -hmm. uh, that's more protective. So even if their wells found some, it doesn't mean that we're going to be pulling it up because of a plume or... Right. That's right. Again, that's, and that's something we were hoping to confirm both in terms of assessing, getting a little more information about those wells on the base, as well as the supplemental investigation that the Army is doing. We'll, we'll learn more from that. Um, but preliminarily, it looks like um, most of that contamination is, is, is likely shallow um, and should not be affecting the city's wells. But again, we want to we go through the steps and verify that. And we'll get this information back to it, reported back to us or through public if, works? I, I would think if that's the, the pleasure of the council, okay. then yes, we can certainly return and provide that okay. to you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thanks for coming out today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, and you're very welcome. Thank you. We'll move on to uh, call upon Paul Martin, the Active Transportation Coordinator for Orange County Transit Authority for an OC bike loop update. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Again, I'm Paul Martin from the Orange County Transportation Authority. Thank you to staff for asking me to come out uh, to talk about the OC Loop project. So this is a project that OCTA has been partnering with local jurisdictions on for over five years. So I've actually come to this council a few different times in the past, and I'm happy to go through our presentation today again. Uh, I do want to give a little attention. Uh, in the back, there's a scout in uniform. That's my son. 
Spencer. So he gets to see his father hard at work today. Uh, he's actually working on the citizenship in the community of Maribadge, and one of the items is coming to a city council, so he gets to see me hard at work, and then we'll hang out a, a little bit as well. But it's a school night, so I don't know how deep your agenda will go. So I had to do that, give him a little bit, uh, you know, public shaming there. So. <laughs> All right, so the OC Loop, what is the OC Loop? It is a vision for a 66 mile, mostly off street path for bicycling and walking that improves the quality of life and supports freedom for car dependency and promoting healthy living. Major segments of the project include the planned Union Pacific right of way, trail through the cities of La Habra, Brea, Yorba Linda and Placentia, as well as the El Cajon Trail that makes its way down to the Santa Ana River Trail, as well as the Santa Ana River Trail all the way down to the coast, and then the coastal trail that we all know and endear along uh, Huntington Beach and through the Seal Beach area. And then lastly, wrapping it up, the Cowdy Creek and San Gabriel River Trails, connecting back up towards the La Habra area. The OC Loop is really just stitching together some of these strong trails that exist throughout the county and giving it branding. Uh, I call it a handle, right? Something that people throughout the state can say, oh, that OC Loop thing. Sure, we'll give you money for that, right? It gives it more energy rather than just each of these segments with disparate names and maybe disconnects, right? The OC Loop gives it more of this understanding that can be... Um, strengthen and promoted whenever we're going after funding throughout the state or the region. Uh, click through, forgot about that. Benefits of the OC loop. So we wanna always highlight what are the benefits? What are we talking about? Now the good news is about 80% of the OC loop is already built today. So we do have a mix of benefits and we're not just talking about fast cyclists, we're talking about a mix of user types, families and students, commuters, as well as fitness enthusiasts. And the OC Loop provides an improved quality of life through access to recreational opportunities as well as local businesses, such as the Main Street businesses here in town. Throughout the entirety of the OC Loop, we do see connections to about 200 parks and 180 schools throughout the county. And with minimal stops and crossings, it's also a viable route for connections to jobs, as well as connections to numerous bus stops and three Metrolink stations. The idea behind the OC Loop is really providing a, a low stress route for bicycling and walking and separation from car traffic as much as possible. And studies show a growth in property values near trails, leveraging those investments that we've already made. Now, OCTA doesn't build and construct bikeways per se. That is a task that's led by the local jurisdictions, the city here or the county or potentially even Caltrans. But we do provide support, best practices and funding support or promotion like tonight's presentation and collaboration across all our agency peers. In 2015, the County of Orange utilized a grant to complete a gap feasibility study to evaluate how can we address the remaining segments. At the time, only 70% of the loop was constructed in the last five years. We've seen about 10% completed with all the energy that's gone on throughout the county. So that gap feasibility study done by the county was aimed towards positioning for grant pursuits and really creating some more momentum to close the gaps. I'm happy to say there's, there is a good amount of funding available. Throughout the state, there's a program called the Active Transportation Program. Last year, the funding program provided over $400 million for bicycle and pedestrian projects throughout the state of California. And then locally within Orange County, about every two years, OCTA is able to provide funding for about 20 to $25 million. So the state money is a, a big pot, as well as we've got dedicated money that's just for Orange County agencies through OCTA. More information is always available on the OC Loop Project website. 
there you can look at those resources such as the county feasibility study. And then at OCTA, we published something called the 70-30 plan. Remember back in the day, it was only 70% built. The 70-30 plan is really just an executive summary and it simplifies an engineering document into essentially a, a one page fact sheet on each of the segments that remain highlighting either constructed segments or what it takes to build the remaining segments. In that 7030 document, we do have an optimal schedule, trying to identify the dollar amounts uh, in a best case scenario. If an agency really wants to tackle a remaining segment, how long would it take to work its way through an engineering process? of all that preliminary design, final design, right of way acquisition and construction and so on. Now I wanna highlight segments that go through the area here in Seal Beach. So there's a naming mechanism that's by letters. So segments L and M travel through the Seal Beach area and really close the gap between the San Gabriel River Trail and Huntington Beach, the Sunset Beach area. So we've got those two segments. Um, segment L is the more southerly piece. Let me point on the screen. Which really travels along Coast Highway through the Naval Weapons Station. And the idea is how can we get from Anderson at the Water Tower north to Seal Beach Boulevard? Now today, technically, it's bikeable there's a bike lane on the roadway or there's a shoulder and people do travel there. But the comfort level isn't exactly the best. So part of the idea was how do we actually Im improve that comfort level so that people on cruisers will feel just as comfortable as somebody riding a fast bike who's willing to put up with being directly adjacent car traffic. Now that segment is led by Caltrans. Caltrans owns that roadway. So even if the city of Seal Beach wants to make something happen, there's a lot of collaboration with Caltrans and of course uh, the military and the Department of Defense. Now the county feasibility study recommends a barrier separation like the one shown on the screen on the left. So you imagine that image on the right showing the actual conditions today along Coast Highway traveling over through the Naval Weapons Station where a gentleman on a cruiser wants to ride through going maybe towards Sunset Beach here, as well as someone in a, a, a longer duration ride on a, a fast bike trying to travel through there. Both people I'm sure would prefer a greater separation from bike, um, car traffic. So you imagine that image on the left was some sort of medium barrier. Caltrans has standards to be able to provide that. Now it could be on the roadway or maybe there's space behind that curb in between the curb and the fence line with the military. So it sounds easy enough, but then we recognize there's bridges over Kitts Highway and over the, the bay as well. So those come with costs and come with challenges of their own, let alone dealing with the, the government, federal government, right? But part of the idea is to say there are solutions out there where there's a will, there's a way. Okay, back to this image, segment M is the kind of a circuitous route, but traveling through town along Electric and Marina. Today there's already a bikeway along the edge of Seal, ne Seal Beach Naval Weapons Station along this edge. So the county study recommends widening the Seal Beach Boulevard off street bikeway and improvements to really strengthen that connection and get up to Coast Highway. And remember these improvements in these ideas are how to improve access for all users. We're not just talking about fast moving cyclists, which may actually prefer to stay on Coast Highway in this area. But it's myself, it's my son, it's my wife, it's your family members who want to be able to enjoy a weekend ride through town and be able to get through and have a solid connection. This rendering shows the recommendation from the county 
which suggests shifting the bike lane away from the car parking on the right edge and shifting it to the left edge along Electric Avenue. <coughs> now, no change to the green belt or parkway there in the center of the road was proposed. We recognize that was, that was always a non-starter during the feasibility work and the work done by the county and the public engagement at that time. But this concept does allow bicyclists to ride away from parked cars and provide some stronger connection and visibility when riding along electric through town. Where Electric Avenue connects with 6th Street, connections would make your way to Marina Drive and bicyclists could then ride along Marina Drive where there's already an off-street trail on the northern edge as well as on-street bike lanes. And that gap study recommends that final connection either down to the Trails End Cafe uh, to the, get to the San Gabriel River Trail or to just use Marina Drive and provide some sort of improved crosswalk at that location for the users today in this image, you know, with, with no crosswalk, no designated crossing, anything. So that recommended study provided some suggestions at those locations. And we would want to highlight, again, this is in town, so this would be something that Seal Beach would lead, something that is customized and would be best suited for the city of Seal Beach. So with that, I want to offer up um, the opportunity for any questions that I can help out with about this or other projects as well. Thank you. Councilmember Kalman? Yes, hi. Um, we've had discussions recently with the U.S. Navy with regard to their project at the wharf and uh, we've been told that once the wharf has moved from its present location to the new location that the buffer zone that they require will also shift which would leave a lot more space for realignment and having off highway dedicated bike lane right. um, the big sticking point would of course be the kits highway and the um, you know, the other bridge. Right. Uh, yeah. Because apparently the bridges, neither bridge is able to have anything um, hung off the side, cantilevered, so it would require something new. So given that, um, when do we need to start coming to OCTA for support and going to Caltrans to uh, get them to want to fund this? So then um, I've, been paying attention to some degree about the wharf project but every time i ask the military where the buffer zone is they won't give me an answer i think it's on purpose uh but that idea is well suited right if the the wharf and the blast zone is further away from coast highway there's better opportunity for making something happen so at this point this is where we provide the best practices support to local jurisdictions or strategic support what are those funding opportunities when is the best time Right. So I mentioned the state program that provides a lot of funding uh, is pretty much on a two year cycle. So next year, about this time, probably actually probably more like June, the state is going to be having a deadline for grant applications. So there's an opportunity for the local jurisdiction to say even collaborate with Caltrans. Caltrans is eligible to pursue funding as well to say, let's work on maybe joint or maybe encourage Caltrans to go after funding for preliminary design work to be able to say, well, let's do preliminary design and environmental on what it takes to build that bridge and really figure out the final, you know, costs and what the implications are, what the impacts to the community are, uh, to do all that environmental review. So a grant application could be submitted next June to get the funding in the subsequent fiscal year. Now, if the, uh, if the work on the wharf at this point looks to be about five years out, um, can, can a project be go through all of the environmental process and then funding um, without the funding being lost, or do you have to time it so the funding hits just when the Navy says, okay, you can have this space now? That, that's all the Navy. So I, I wish I knew, but in general, a five-year time frame for when the Navy is going to do the work on their property uh, may actually be well-suited, right? Unfortunately, these things are 
have a long drawn out process. I'm talking about potentially a grant application in 2020 where you would get the money in July of 2021. It's going to take two or three years at least to go through the design, environmental, and then subsequent grant applications to get funding. So, so let's start now. Yeah, uh, it's definitely. Well, I always want you to start now, right? So I'd be happy to see these things happen. But it, it may take five years to go through that process. Uh, it's on Coast Highway, so Caltrans would be involved. They've got typical schedules as well. Uh, but yeah, it's these aren't so easy that they could be built next year, right. unfortunately. We knew that, but yeah, that's why we had the gaps, right? They are the hardest segments that remain throughout the county. Yeah. Great. So that sorry, um, that's the state funding program, but also OCTA has funding that will probably be late summer. Uh, that could serve the same purpose. So it's almost submit an application to the state and submit a similar or the same application to OCTA. And uh, um, submitting the same application to both agencies is okay. So go ahead and do, and then you've got, you know, two hats in the ring rather than one. Great. Okay. Okay. Councilman or must love it. Um, is I know I get the the loop idea, but would you or whomever makes these decisions consider a tributary to that loop? If Seal Beach um, installed a bike lane, say on Westminster Avenue, that fed into the connection to the San Gabriel River mm -hmm. portion of the loop, yeah. is that something that could be considered? because you know it, it's kind of a tributary so i don't know if they would even consider that sure yes yeah. so then i didn't touch on it but generally these funding programs the state or the octa funding programs they don't strictly have to be the oc loop it could be those city-led projects that are feeding into the oc loop and that can be part of the sales pitch that this is something that's important to the city and we are reinforcing the strength of things like the OC loop by providing greater connections to it or spokes into that. That's all totally uh, acceptable as well. Yeah. Okay, so putting them both together separately, then that might work. Yes, so then it's always at the discretion of the city, what is your highest priority? We talk about the OC loop, we would encourage Caltrans and the city to look at these gaps but also if you said, that's great, but we also have this other priority, this other thing that is um, you know, more prominent or something else that we really want to address, then that's fine as well. That's okay, and there are funding programs for that. Yeah, it doesn't look like there's any gaps in the Seal Beach portion. Yeah, so then uh, that coloring, I guess. Um, the first slide. Yes, yeah, yeah. so this coloring, I didn't touch base on the graphic. We show the dash lines for the gaps, the more clear cut gaps. But then the blue segment in Seal Beach is on purpose is more of an enhancement because of that dynamic. Technically, there are bikeways through this area. Electric, for example, yeah. does have a striped bikeway. The Coast Highway does technically have a bikeway, but it doesn't quite fit with that vision of the OC Loop of serving a, a wider audience, not just the Saturday morning crowd that's going yeah, fast through it. town. I get it. Okay. Council Member Verapapa. Hey, uh, thank you. Um, the segment M portion through the city and the entire loop, is that the only portion that's through a city, a residential type area that you can recall? Because to, to my knowledge, most of it's off, you know, off um, roadway uh, in the river jetty, so to speak, um, Pacific Coast Highway. But is, is the segment M the only portion within a residential area? It's not. So the directly south in Huntington, uh, the routing for the OC Loop uses Pacific. Wow. The one way, a couplet through town, uh, through to Warner, essentially. Now that's a slower speed street. It's about 15 miles per hour posted in the, the car parking there. So that, that's a slower one as well. And then in the... But it's not necessarily a residential neighborhood, if you will, as, you know, sure. like electric and... Also, in, um, then up in 
Yorba Linda area, there's another segment where there's um, gaps in the El Cajon Trail where there's an off-street bikeway mm -hmm. that there was there's no opportunity to provide another off-street. So the county worked, uh, it's unincorporated Yorba Linda area. The county went ahead and striped in the bikeway connections. It's more like wayfinding in that area, but the streets are 25 mile per hour posted because it's residential too. Well, the reason I ask is my observation on Saturday morning and when I go out and walk the dog every Saturday and Sunday morning and sometimes during the week is most of the bike riders are on Pacific Coast Highway coming southbound from Long Beach or northbound towards Long Beach, mm -hmm. that area. And they don't, they may or may not get on the, the loop portion. So I would question why would you take them off in a residential area to kind of slow down, which sometimes they do not. Sure. We've, you know, we've all witnessed that in our, sure. in our neighborhood. Not, I'm not talking about the beach cruiser people. I'm talking about the um, faster bikes and stuff like that. Why wouldn't you take it up? You know, First Street, for example, and then make a right turn on, on Pacific Coast Highway and just keep them on Pacific Coast Highway because in my observation, 90% of them, except for the people that want to stop for a cup of coffee by the pier, are just, you know, going down Pacific Coast through Highway town. or up Pacific Coast Highway, not necessarily through the residential area to kind of leisurely cruise around yeah. because they're kind of going someplace or coming from someplace, so to speak. So then, and then that gets into the user types, right? Kind of that vision of the OC loop isn't necessarily for just fast riders, that you're providing that opportunity for a strong connection to things like the San Gabriel River. Yeah. That still you might have families that say, I'd like to ride to that, but not have to get in my car and just drive to it to provide a con continuous route to be able to get to it. So all the fast riders are probably gonna disregard Electric Avenue. It isn't the most straight route. Right. It is a little more circuitous, but that would better serve uh, a bigger audience of people who are interested in riding. That's, that's that vision, at least for the OC Loop, as much as possible. So who would lead that project for Segment M? Would that be a city-led or OCTA-led? Or I, I know there's always grants and there's always applications, and mm -hmm. we've, you know, we've done those, uh, you know, countless times and sometimes we win and sometimes we don't but who, yeah. who would lead this specific segment per se it would be the city so the city could be able to customize it for whatever is best suited for the city at this point the octa board of directors isn't interested in going into local jurisdictions and saying thou shalt have a bikeway and it's going to look like this right that is that's a non-starter it's much more about trying to be support uh, how we can help local jurisdictions and figure out to address those those gaps in the network. Yeah, that would kind of leads into my next question because we've all noticed recently um, a lot of restriping along Studebaker in Long Beach with the Ballards and the green striping. Is that something that you foresee happening on this loop or how would that come into play? Because I know Long Beach is very proactive and, and stuff like that. Would that sure. be something that we'd be looking at on the loop or how would that? Again, if it suits the city. So things like green paint get done to highlight conflict zones typically where merging and weaving occurs. So as a motorist is maybe gonna make a right turn and they're crossing over a bike lane, maybe you put the green striping. Some of the stuff in Belmont Shore is a little more even above and beyond that, right? A continuous green. But typically within the industry, we talk about green striping as much more highlighting conflict zones in, in a more concentrated location. Uh, there's the federal government has said, you can use this green paint, it's standardized, follow this approach and you're good. Uh, the state of California has gotten a blanket approval to be able to use it, uh, but it's just a toolbox item. So if a local jurisdiction says, we don't want to go there, then fine, that's okay. Uh, with every toolbox item, it's up to the local staff to figure out what's appropriate for their jurisdiction. Okay, that's good to hear because I wasn't advocating it by any means. But no, it's up to you guys, you. definitely. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. And I'll call upon the OCFA Division Chief, Ron Roberts, who will give an update on Gum Grove Park. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, uh, city council members, city staff, and residents. Uh, my name is Ron Roberts. I'm the Division I Chief for your Orange County Fire Authority, responsible for the city of Seal Beach. I wanted to just take a moment tonight to bring a project to you that uh, I think I really think is a success between the city and your fire department. And that was a, some work that we did in Gum Grove Park. Um, at the request of the city manager Ingram, uh, we were asked, could we bring our hand crew in to do a little cleanup work in Gum Grove Park? Uh, if you remember during the spring, it was very wet and there was quite a lot of growth uh, that took place in there. So we did bring the hand crew in, and for those that don't know, the hand crew is a uh, specialty group that, as a member of the OCFA, you have access to. It's one of your resources that you can bring in. It's 18 highly trained men and women that uh, work mostly in the wildland environment, but they, uh, they do operate heavy machinery, and some of the residents may have heard quite a bit of noise coming out of Gum Grove because we were there multiple days, uh, but it was us, and it was all good. Um, so if I may, just to um, show you here, uh, for those that aren't familiar with Gum Grove, um, it's about a 15-acre project is where we were working mostly. So you have um, Avalon is on the west entrance there. That's the main way into the park. Crest View uh, parallels the park and is that bottom, the southerly edge. And then you have the Hellman Ranch Trail uh, off to the east and then the preserve uh, to the north. And as you can see, uh, again, we had about 15 acres in there that we did a forest health improvement and fuels reduction uh, is what we did. Just a couple slides, uh, maybe a little hard to see, but what the hand crew did was uh, what we call some of the fuel that in between the ground and the top of the tree, we call that ladder fuels. The crew was able to go in there, reduce that load, which uh, should a fire occur in there, would hopefully reduce um, the spread and help us to get a better handle on it quicker. Uh, we didn't want, since this is a nature park, we did not want to go in there and scrape everything to bare dirt because there's animals that live in there, it's a habitat, and the folks want a nature park. So um, it's not taken down to dirt, but we had some good results. And here's pictures, and I apologize, they're probably not showing up very well here uh, due to the lighting, but um, they went in there, did some good work. And there you can see a little bit of where we were able to uh, clean things up a little bit, make it a, a little more, uh, like I said, fire safe uh, for the city. Um, I want to thank Director Miter and uh, Tim Kelsey from the Rec Department and the city arborist, uh, Joe Tolarico, uh, for helping us, giving us their guidance. Uh, without them, that I don't think we would have been successful. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Council Member Bear Papa. Um, yeah, thank you for your service, and we re really appreciate the work that you do and the proactive approach out there. I always get calls about fire danger and stuff like that. And, and recently I read an article about uh, Los Angeles County with these high fire areas, if you will, and, mm -hmm. and the uh, potential risks that they pose with um, people sleeping in these parks. You know, not, not this park, but in general, um, high fire parks. Are you familiar with that? Yes, sir. And, and what have you, what have you um, read about it or know about it? So it just so happens that about a week ago, I was with a colleague who works for Los Angeles City Fire. And it's actually a Los Angeles City ordinance that when certain weather conditions are met, low humidity and high winds, um, they are able to move homeless out of fire-prone areas, and they're pre-identified areas, but LAPD is able to move those people. And it also, a, a second part to that is that a lot of their uh, parking areas up in like the Hollywood Hills, for instance, uh, where they enforce strict parking regulations during fire season and fire conditions, they're able to beef that up. This actually came out of the Skirball fire right. two years ago. Um, I don't know if you remember that one, but that started in a homeless encampment that was out of sight and was able to get established and really start to move before anybody really detected it. And that's where multi-million dollar homes were burned. Yeah. Uh, that's where that was came, yeah, came and, out of. And fortunately, we don't have that problem here 
at this time, but I think you know a proactive approach for the council and the city to look at is something to that effect, maybe an ordinance in the near future to kind of prevent that, you know, instead of being reactive to something like that. Do you think, um, City Manager Ingram, we could do something like that in the near future? Maybe, um, I know we're going to have a st strategic planning meeting coming up in the next, you know, few months or so. Maybe we can talk about that in depth and just kind of get something on the on the board just to kind of... Sure, we'd be happy to. Okay, yeah. So... And I guess you would maybe be part of that too, to you know, give us the time. I, frame. I, I think I would probably get asked. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks well, again. Thank you, Mayor. If I could, I just wanted to thank uh, Chief Roberts once again, as well as Tim and Joe. Um, I know uh, when they initially got started on this project, they got pulled off for a fire, so that's when, the reason why they were in there a couple different times because they were actually the hand crew was out um, working fire. So really want to say thank you for that as Ron said it is a resource that as a city we have access to when we need it and really was a, a, a good collaborative project and um, I want to say thank you thank you thank you thank you thanks and I'm going to call upon Ron Roberts once more to receive a proclamation for fire prevention week <laughs> thanks again for all the work that you do thank you thanks appreciate it if i if i can steal the mic for just a second I, again I'll, i promise to be brief just to remind the citizens uh, thank you for the proclamation that it means a lot and it shows a good partnership between the city and and the orange county fire authority um October is our safety message is uh, home fire escape, home fire drill. Uh, I'd urge, urge you all to please uh, sit with your families, develop a plan for exiting your home. Uh, you want to have at least two exits from each room if possible. Uh, and talk that over and exercise it, practice it. Thank you. Thank you. I'll call upon Steve Rapp to t discuss turkey trot event update. Thank you for having me, everybody up there and in the audience. Um, here to talk about the Seal Beach Turkey Trot, it's the in inaugural turkey trot. A um, little bit about myself, I'm a third generation Seal Beach resident. Grandparents are here in the 40s. Father was born in, I can't remember when, but went to Zoder and McGaw, and he still lives in town. And we've been residents, my wife and I, for uh, 14 years with two kids. Second one's still in McGaw. Um, I partnered up with Jason Bruton to put on this event. It's the inaugural Seal, Seal Beach Turkey Trot. Um, tell you a little bit about it. There we go. Um, it's not gonna be on Thanksgiving. It's going to be the Saturday before Thanksgiving. Our vision is to kick off Thanksgiving week. Um, our participation projection is 1,000 to 2,000 people. Spectator projection is about the same. And we are going to start and finish on Main Street, right at Central, right in front of Hennessy's there. There are four events. There's a 10K run and walk. There's a 5K run and walk. There's a 1K Don't Be a Turkey Turkey Trot, and there's a 5K Gym Challenge. Gym Challenge is something new. There's a five station accumulator along the run. So it's a 5K run at about every half mile to three quarters mile. There's a fitness um, station that you have to do. So you do 10 push ups, then you do 10 push ups and 20 burpees, then you do 10, 20, 30, and so on. The fifth station will be on Main Street between Central and uh, Ocean, hoping there'll be a big crowd cheering everybody on because they'll be very tired by the time they get to that point. 
the course, I kind of mentioned it, the start and finish is on uh, Central and Main, right there by Hennessy's. Uh, Hennessy's is our restaurant sponsor. Goes down to Ocean, makes a left, goes up to Electric, hangs a U-turn, goes all the way back up to First, then kind of does a fork in the road up top there. The 10K will do two loops of this, and they both finish right up onto Main Street. We have two charities that we're benefiting. Uh, the first one is Project Seek. I have one child that went through Magaw. We're supporters of Project Seek. Pro for those of you who don't know, Project Seek raises funds to staff three credentialed teachers for the Art, Technology, and Media Center programs. Um, my daughter still goes to Magaw. We still support it. Every registration donates to Project Seek. We've given Project Seek the opportunity to raise more money if they market it on their end with a code that they use. The second charity is Grateful Hearts, which feeds families in need. Uh, every, once again, every registration donates to Grateful Hearts. Um, they have the opportunity to market more and raise more money for their charity. And our goal there is to feed 300 families for Thanksgiving. Uh, for the community, you know, why start and stop on Main Street? Um, my main reason is I love Main Street. I've been there my whole life. I've seen it. I've walked down it. I've ran down it. I've rode my bike down it. It's a beautiful place. Um, we feel it will support the business that are, businesses that are there. It's a great visibility point for them. Everybody's lining up right on Main Street. All the businesses there are visible. They can do marketing on their own to, to give some visibility to the run. Um, we all know the restaurants will benefit as they do with Run Seal Beach. Um, the community outreach, you know, there's minimal street closures that we we're showing you with the, uh, with the route, trying to minimize how much has to be closed. Um, this also allows people to still get to Main Street. So the side streets are still open. Electric Avenue is still open. Um, so there's a lot of streets still open that people can still get to their place that they need to go to up until about 1030, which is our closure time. So the... Um, We'll also find solutions for any business that feels distressed during the race. So if it's a salon that uh, feels their, their client can't get to the salon, we can get them an Uber, give them a code, and the Uber can pick them up, take them back, and they don't have to skip a beat. Um, community email, we can offer um, any business that feels distressed to blast out on our email um, platform. We have a 120,000 person database from all the runs that have been done. Um, so that could be quite beneficial to some as well. Uh, demographics, a little bit more female than male, 28 to 44. Uh, the current prices, oops, current prices go from $10 up to 45, and on race day it'll go from $10 up to 55. We'll have a price increase here in a little bit. Um, marketing, so we've been doing email messaging and. Like I said, our email database is about 120,000 people. Um, we've been blasting out emails since June, maybe every two to three weeks. Um, we have a partner email database of about 180,000. Um, so it's totaling about 720,000 emails that have been sent out once we get to race day. Social media or media, um, Facebook, Instagram, and Google. We have ads running, um, and we'll run them up until the race. Um, there's about 1 million to 1.5 impressions. Uh, we, we have a race calendar listing, which is common for races. Um, race place is another destination, and as well as active. Our sponsors for the event are the Financial Partners Credit Union, Synergy Oil and Gas, Hennessy's Tavern, Snail's Pace, sponsor, current sponsors for the Gym Challenge are West Grove Fitness, Beach Fitness, and Nine Round, which is right in Naples, just over the Second Street Bridge. The awards, um, all finishers will get uh, awards, and they'll be rewarded with an award. Um, so the 10K is on the far left, the kids' turkey trots on the far right, and I think that's all I got. Do you have any questions? 
um, what hours would the street closures be in effect? So we've been working uh, monthly, been working with uh, the city and the fire department, everybody, and talking about that. And currently, what time was it? About 5 a.m. they'll start closing, about 10.30. Councilmember Rivera Papa. I just have a quick question. Um, Steve, it sounds like a great event, and I'm definitely going to try to try to attend this. Um, do you have a limit on the number of members or um, participants? Like, are you limiting it, or is it just? We don't. We have about, um, we're, we're thinking there's going to be about 1,500 people. 15, okay. That's our goal. And, and the closure starts at 5 a.m. What time does the race start, just so I don't miss it? Right now it's 7. 7. But we'll just have to see, depending on how many you know, participants and if we have to shut, you know, shuffle anything to make sure. The goal okay. is to get Main Street back open as quickly as possible. That's the Great. main goal. Sounds good. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move on to oral communications. At this time, members of the public may address the council regarding any items within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the council cannot discuss or take action on any items not on the agenda unless authorized by law. Matters not on the agenda may, at the council's discretion, be referred to the city manager and placed on a future agenda. Those members of the public wishing to speak are asked to come forward to the microphone and state their name for the record. All speakers will be limited to a period of five minutes. Speakers must address their comments only to the mayor and entire city council and not to any individual member of the staff or audience. Any documents for review should be presented to the city clerk for distribution. Good evening, I'm Dr. Jody Rubanis with the Los Alamitos Council of PTAs. And some of you are very familiar to me. I'm here to talk about walk and bike to school, which I think has already been on your agenda tonight, bravo. Um, McGaugh Elementary School has been a strong supporter. I want to just mention that the international walk and bike to school is was October 2nd but uh, it's all of our elementary schools in the school district celebrating it, and Weaver was not in session. And then last week on the 9th, it was Yom Kippur, so that wasn't a good date either. So we're celebrating it this Wednesday, uh, October 16th, and I strongly invite everyone here, several of you have already participated, um, to uh, meet us at 715 at either Heron Point or Pavilion's parking lot, and we'll have our principal there and assistant principal. And thank you for your support in the past. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. My name is Rob Janke. I have a business here in town, Javatini's, right just down the corner. I been here for about nine years. I absolutely love Seal Beach. It's been uh, a great experience for me and I love getting involved with the community. I'm also uh, involved with the, uh, um, the Chamber of Commerce here. I'm uh, the current treasurer and I'm here to speak on behalf of the Chamber and uh, I want to make sure to let you all know that we are here to work together as a team with the Council and the City because uh, we, we support all the businesses here and uh, we, we, we want this to be a good synergy between everyone because I think that's a win-win for everyone. Um, Want to just let you know we have a, cute, a few things coming up uh, for the chamber. Of course, we always have uh, candy that we hand out to the kids coming up uh, in the end of uh, October. Well, you'll be seeing flyers on the street coming up. Uh, we also have um, an uncorked and unwind event at the Senior Center on October 17th at 6 p.m. And that's where we'll have uh, local businesses uh, that will uh, serve wine and tell you a little bit about their business, which I think is a pretty cool new thing to do. Um, that's the first ever that we've done that. And another thing that we've started to do recently 
It's a, a let's do lunch. And uh, we've been hosting that more recently at Finbar's Italian Kitchen. Our next one is coming up on October 23rd at 12 uh, p.m. That's a $15 fee for chamber members, 20 for non-chamber members. And if you ever run into people that are considering starting a business in town, be sure to point them to, to us and so that they can participate in these things. And uh, again, if our businesses do well, then you all do well with our revenues through the sales tax and whatnot. So uh, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. <laughs> to a sparky old town, Seal Beach. <coughs> um, I am also a member of the Seal Beach Chamber for probably 30 years, and I'm also on the Governmental Affairs Committee about what's happening in Sacramento. And I'm sitting here tonight, I want to talk about transparency with uh, the city manager, but I'm talking, I, I got this email the other day about Los Alamitos water being bad, and none of you ask. Our kids go to school up there. Don't you have kids to go, Mayor Moore? All of you have kids to go to school up there. I do too, my grandkids. And I got an email. He told us about the Navy base, but he didn't talk about Los Alamitos, that they have bad water. I'm gonna ask the principal tomorrow. Then we got into the bike trail. Well, I walked that bike trail from down at the restaurant all the way up to PCH and back every day. And they're crazy. It's supposed to be five miles an hour, but they, they have the electric bikes now. They have the scooters. Now the other day I'm going and they've got these they don't even have to have hands on the scooters. They got these things that you roll down anywhere around in town. I mean, what are we doing here? And you better put a light like you have down there at Marina, Marina. You better put a light up there because the people are going insane trying to get to Second Street. They don't slow down for anything or anybody. And the bikers don't stop in town. And then we get to Gum Grove Park. I was told that we're homeless people up there in tents, but the cops couldn't get them out. I hope you got them out. I hope he got them out, because my granddaughter goes up there on a bike with her friend. I said, you can't go up there anymore until they get the homeless people out. Remember the guy that set up on, on Main Street at Hennessy East? How long was he there? A couple months. You couldn't move him. Cops couldn't move him. We had to sit there. You had to go by him. People were feeding him. He had his porta potty, drink, doing marijuana at night with his son. Couldn't, the police, the police chief then told me we couldn't buy the ticket. He wanted to go to Las Vegas. The church bought him the ticket. So now we got homeless people up in Gum Grove Park, and the cops can't move them. And you're putting that pool over there on First Street. Who do you think is going to live on that park on First Street? <laughs> and now we're here with the turkey trot. The Seal Beach Chamber has been feeding Thanksgiving dinner to, to people that don't have any place to go for about 30 years at St. Anne's Church. And they have so many coming that they have to call and get an appointment or come anyway because they will feed you. The Seal Beach Chamber has been feeding homeless people that don't have homes to go. And here we are with a turkey trot. We, ha we have a 10K run, and the 10K run gives money back to all the sports, the city, for people that can't afford, like junior guards. I know they give money to them. I'm just, I want to talk about transparency. And here we are. We got a bike trail already through town. And nobody, they don't stop. I sit down there with coffee and I just go in, I can't believe it. Nobody stops for any stop signs. 
So where are we going with this city? We're going nowhere with it. And now the governor has signed some new documents for people that have units. And you didn't take care of us, you didn't take care of Old Town when you did Surfside. So now I'm determined that people with units deserve to get a bathroom and a closet. 30 seconds to wrap up. So I have written HUD, the federal government, and they put me in contact with California. But now the governor has said it's time for you to stop and let them go in. And don't overcharge them and don't make them come back over and over. So next time I'll get to transparency, especially about Linda Devine, who was our city clerk and you ran off. My name is Lisa Johnston, and I'm the Project SEEK president at MAGA. And I just wanted to thank you for listening to the Turkey Trot information today and hopefully in, be in support of it because we work so hard to fund these programs at MAGA and to have a family event that helps support us, it's just really refreshing and just so, um, it's so great for our community. So I just wanted to thank the Turkey Trot and thank you. Thank you all. Good evening, my name is Blair Petrini. I am a over 30 year resident of Seal Beach and live right off Main Street at Electric. And I'm also the founder and director of Grateful Hearts, which is one of the recipients of the Turkey Trot as well. Um, been there for over 21 years. And one of the, the uh, main groups of people that we serve is our very own Joint Force Training Base. So um, for a number of years, we take a lot of those Thanksgiving meals that were talked about when, when um, I think you can never do enough of a good thing. And there are always other people. And so a big target uh, group, again, that we have is the Joint Force Training Base. There are many of our soldiers that have given, sacrificed their time, their families, and those are the ones that we help um, continuously when there is a deployment of soldiers and we help their families and provide things for their training as well as the ones that are having difficulties and so we do provide those Thanksgiving and holiday meals as well as adopt a family Christmas program for kids not just the those of our soldiers but many others who would otherwise go without children within our own school district that live in this area and Los Alamitos and Seal Beach. I have been, 20 years ago, I was the recipient of phone calls from single moms here in Orange County in our own backyard saying that their children, they and their children were going to bed at night hungry because they didn't have enough food to eat. And another single mom calling saying her children were not attending school simply because they had no clothing to wear. So it is happening in our own backyard and it's really not about, um, well, it's a matter of perspective and we'll just leave it with that. But there are people, there's a difference between giving a hand up and a hand out. And many of these people, we are seeing them become uh, contributors to their to our own community and they are also serving right alongside with them, with us. And so I just count it a privilege. And thank you so much. I what is one of the things I love about Seal Beach, it, it is it is a hometown community and we do care about one another and helping to better the lives of those around us and helping those that are unfortunate get to the next step. And so um, I'm looking forward to this turkey trot. I think it can be an excellent opportunity for businesses where we can encourage the runners and the um, spectators to stay and play at the beach, to stay and sip and shop and just enjoy a day and hopefully make that day not a distressing day for businesses, but a day that the businesses can look and say, oh my gosh, I got more business today than I have gotten in a long time. And I think that is a possibility and um, just an awesome opportunity. So thank you so much.
Any other comments? Hi, Jeanette Andrus, Old Town Seal Beach. Um, I, good evening everyone, Honorable Mayor, Council Members, staff, and the public. I am actually here to talk about uh, the Magaw Carnival, which is this Saturday. Um, I'm a Magaw parent, I'm a first grader there, and I just want everybody to know, um, it's Saturday, October 19th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., and there's gonna be a lot of family-friendly games and attractions, including a puppy party instead of a petting zoo. That's new, yeah, so puppies. Um, and you can buy tickets at magawtickets.com. There's also a silent auction um, and a lot of local businesses have donated to this auction to help support the school. Um, the carnival is the number one fundraiser for the Parent Teacher Association at McGaw. So um, it's a great opportunity for everybody in the community to come out and show their support to, to the school, which is the only public elementary school in the city, the only LAUSD school in the city. So I encourage everybody to come on out. All right, thanks. <coughs> Any other comments? Okay, City Attorney Steele, do you have anything? To, oh, sorry. I'm uh, Bruce Bennett, Old Town, formerly in Mike's district also. I uh, had three items, really one I was going to speak with, but uh, a few days ago, I uh, double checked what I would normally double check, which is on the CalPERS numbers because they come in kind of late and they get here and they affect your ability to do your budgeting, uh, your strategic objectives. And I added it up, that would be a catch-up payment to pay for what we haven't paid for in the past, if it was done in a lump sum. And that would be about $41,984,000 and that, from my recollection last time, we were at about 31 million. So while I've harped on it, and it's been an issue that does crowd out the wants and needs of the community, many of the items we talked about tonight, it does still need to be addressed. And hopefully you'll be able to do something about coming up with a plan or, a, or some type of a goal now that we have the PB funds. Interrelated to that is the issue uh, tonight of uh, your uh, energy tubulars that's coming up where we granted them a relief probably in 2007 when we really needed more revenue or they needed more revenue to operate after our demise in the economy, the big huge uh, recession, second worst since the depression. So we encourage them to stay and I think that is about 12 years and I'm sure J uh, Vicky will cover all that. And it's important to have a revenue source, but we have given in the 12 years when I looked at Dr. Goldberg's summary, we've subsidized it during that time of about 700 and some thousand dollars uh, that's what the city has given back to them to encourage them. Now, it's not a Costco or somebody where we could give some money away and get a huge amount, but I would encourage you to discuss it and look at it in, in good detail. Now, remember McNown and uh, the Los Cerritos wetland swap is projecting to drill a lot of wells out of the home, out of the... Uh, uh, pumpkin patch, and uh, if that comes to pass, probably some of their equipment would be used. 
So we have given them already a good, good benefit. And, uh, but I think you really ought to talk about what it should be. Could it be reduced? Where does it stand? And I had one item that came up tonight that I wasn't anticipating talking about. It goes way the hell back when I was on the Environmental Quality Control Board back in the 70s for the city of Seal Beach. My old roommate uh, was a research chemist. Got out of school a little after me. His name was Stephen Lloyd, is Stephen Lloyd. And he did the work on the weapon station. They brought fuel bladders, there were four of them, 200,000 gallons, which they buried around the location for emergency use. They brought them back from Vietnam. And in 85, they did a lot of studies, and one of the studies that he did after they found that there was jet fuel floating on the aquifer was how to get rid of it and how to seal off the tanks. I documented it because I was afraid it would be lost, and it was lost because he, uh, he indicated to me that they buried the report. And uh, I have his name and number. I think it might be handy to try to go back to and, up. and, uh, and uh, recreate what information he has. I think they did it for Lance Alco Aluminum, which now has become... Uh, um, I forgot the name of it. I wrote it down, though. But at any rate, I think that third point is an important point. And certainly, if I lived up by you, Tom, and Shelly, I think I'd want to make sure that gets investigated. Okay. I don't know if it can ever be found or if they buried it well. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments? <clears throat> I'd say, Attorney Steele, do you have anything to report? Mayor, members of the council, prior to the meeting this evening, the council met in closed session regarding the three items on the posted agenda. All members of the council were present, and the council took no reportable action on any item. City Manager Ingram, do you have anything to report? Yes, Mayor, thank you. Just have um, one item. While, while Marine Safety Chief Joe Bailey um, posts this picture up here, um, this is a picture following um, another successful staff development day. Um, which the city facilitated today and personally um, on behalf of myself as well as the entire seal beach staff team want to thank personally thank the council for your ongoing support of allowing us to spend this one day per year um, when city hall is closed to the public um, due to columbus day it is a work day for all of us this wouldn't be possible without your continued support so on behalf of all of us want to say thank you uh, for that um, I also want to personally thank Mayor Moore, Mayor Pro Tem Shelley Sestarsik, and Councilman Joe Kalmick, who came um, and spent lunchtime with us, as well as participated um, in the team building exercises this afternoon. Um, I'm not going to say much more than that because I don't want to steal um, Team City Council's thunder um, on that event, but want to say thank you um, for coming to spend the time with us. As all of you um, probably and hopefully saw, I mean, how important this is to our staff team. And we have you know, several employees in our city, some of which aren't able to participate because they work shifts. Um, but we had over 50 people there today um, and, and really focusing on um, our teamwork and, and important things that make it able for us to really work together as a team to do what we do on a daily basis and provide service to this community. Um, so I want to thank excuse me, thank a couple of people that, that were really worked on behalf of um, our staff development day, the team that really worked hard to put this together for us. Um, Anya Eisenhower, who's the executive assistant in the police chief's office. Dana Ingstrom, our deputy city clerk. Patrick Gallegos, assistant city manager. Michelle Marquez, our senior accounting technician. David Nett, community services coordinator. Anthony Nguyen, recreation coordinator, um, who facilitated one of the exercises this afternoon. Nancy Ralston, HR management analyst. Jennifer Robles, executive assistant. And Grant Tavasi, our account clerk. So as you can see, several employees that really made it possible for this to happen. And I'll tell you how substantial this day is. Um, 
coming back to City Hall, already having employees talking to me about how much the, the team building exercises meant this afternoon and wanting to do another one already next month in November on our own time. So I think that speaks volumes of how important this is and again, wouldn't be possible um, without the five of you continuing to support us doing that. So thank you um, for that. Again, this is a picture that was taken um, of our team before at the end of the um, event. And I as I said, I believe this is the 14th year that we've actually been uh, able to do this. So thank you for that. Thanks. We'll move on to council comments. Council member Verapapa. No comments at this time, thank you. Yeah. Council member Kalman. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to comment on today's event. I thought it was um, it was very well run, and um, it's important to note that the city council team won the battle of building a very interesting object <laughs> during that um, time. But I, I, I think it does have a definite benefit for people that uh, work for a municipality or any government agency, as a matter of fact, because you're, it's very cloistered and it's very restrictive in many ways. And I think for all of the employees to have a little better interaction with their fellow employees who may work in different departments and maybe even, you know, up at the city yard or the police station where they don't get to meet them and talk to them on a more personal level. So I enjoyed that uh, very much today. Last week, um, I had a very busy week. Uh, on Monday, I attended a symposium at um, UC Irvine. It was an all-day symposium that was based on planning and implementing resilient solutions in coastal California. Basically what that means is an entire day with 22 speakers and five panels tackled the issue of sea level rise and what are we gonna do about it? And uh, it was very educational and a little scary. Uh, there were uh, members of the scientific community who presented data and information on the science of sea level rise. Um, there were uh, discussions about current regulations and upcoming regulations that very possibly can affect all of us. And there were discussions um, by, uh, we had the mayor of Imperial Beach and we had a senior planner from the city of San Clemente who presented some information about what they were already doing. Uh, but uh, I must say that lurking in the background was the California Coastal Commission who have the ultimate say-so on what is allowed. So I think this is something that, uh, that our city is, by definition, going to have to take a long, hard look at and see what we can do um, within all of this regulatory atmosphere to um, maintain our community, maintain our coastline, um, and be able to live here. On uh, Thursday, uh, the city hosted two very important meetings here, uh, one of which uh, was a discussion about the Surfside sand replenishment. Um, what we tried to do in this meeting was to come up with a game plan to get the Army Corps of Engineers, who are the ones that have to do this project, to get the funding to do it. Um, it was recognized many years ago that the installation of the two jetties is what causes the beach erosion. They recognize that. And for several years, they, um, they said, we will take care of this. And so for all these years, they would pay for two-thirds of the cost of replenishing the sand on Surfside, which now becomes a feeder beach that goes all the way through Huntington Beach down through Newport Beach. So at this meeting, we had um, our own Seal Beach Public Works staff and Steve Miter um, set this all up for us. We had the Public Works people from City of Huntington Beach, the uh, City of Newport Beach, and the Orange County Public Works Department. And more importantly, not more importantly, but also very important, that we had the uh, field representatives for all four 
of our local legislators, Michelle Steele's office. She actually was on the phone um, during the meeting. Uh, Tyler Deep, our state assemblyman, State Senator Tom Umberg, and Congressman Harley Ruda. And their staff um, displayed a great deal of interest. I mean, not just the thank you for having us interest, uh, that they want to see what political pressure they can bring to bear to get that funding assured. Um, you know, it's like the Corps of Engineers in Washington is this group of people, and they're sitting there with this list of projects, you know, and who knows how they decide, well, let's fund this one, but let's not fund this one anymore. So I think this is, you know, the ball is not rolling, but I think if there's enough of us behind it that we might be able to um, get something done in that regard. The other meeting, which was also important for many of us in the community, is the San Gabriel River trash problem. Um, you know, the San Gabriel River is 58 miles long. It, uh, it, it uh, watershed for over almost 700 square miles. And all of the trash that comes down the river and all the tributaries ends up on our beach. And it's up to us to clean it up. Um, I spoke with uh, management from uh, Republic, who is our trash hauler, and he told me that after the major storm event that we had a few months ago, they collected 229 tons of trash from our beach. So, I mean, this is horrible, uh, not to mention the trash that we don't see, the pollution in the water. So, again, we had the uh, staff from the legislators involved, and they're very interested in um, trying to solve the problem of communication. Um, unlike the Los Angeles River, which has one jurisdiction, the county of Los Angeles, and why you have kayaking in the LA River and you have all kinds of major projects, um, the San Gabriel River is 43 cities and two counties. So um, the state has, has introduced some, some mandates um, that involve installing catch basins. So these would be uh, devices that we would install in our storm drains that will catch the trash before it gets into the storm drain system. Now Seal Beach has, we've already installed, I believe all, over 50% uh, in town and we've applied for more grants to do the rest of it. Um, for some strange reason, the city of Bellflower has already done all theirs. So the name of the game is to apply political pressure to get the other cities and maybe get LA County involved to try and get the catch basins installed. There's a mandate to do it by 2030. That's too long. We don't want to wait 10 years. So uh, I'm, again, uh, nothing's going to happen tomorrow, but We've gotten, I think, further than maybe we have in the past in getting a coalition of other cities and our elected officials who are anxious to see something happen. So, thank you. Thanks. Mayor Pro, Pro Tem Sustarse. Uh, thank you. I'd uh, like to thank uh, Orange County Water Department and for the, the city manager and arranging for them to come and speak uh, tonight. I, I, I know that uh, Golden State Water is also in, in there's from discussions on there that they're involved too and, and I'm sure we can uh, get some more information about Los Alamitos too at, as they look into this. Um, um, I also uh, wanted to thank Jeanette Andrus for uh, talking about McGaw Carnival. Uh, my grandchildren were in town last year and we went to the carnival and we had lots of fun. Uh, they particularly enjoyed the cake walk because they were determined that they were going to win a cake and uh, unfortunately or fortunately we didn't win one but uh, they participated in lots of the booths and rides and, and had a really good time and it's a great, uh, 
it's a great support because as she said, it's their primary fundraiser. So if you can drop by, spend a little time, maybe go to the silent auction, I'm, I'm sure they'd appreciate it. Um, let's see. Uh, the uh, the uh, Joint Forces training base had a new event this year, Meet the Pilots and Crews. They opened up the base when the uh, the Thunderbirds and the snow the Canadian Snowboards Birds and the Royal um, uh, Air Force planes were here, and uh, I decided to go over and take a look. Well, uh, th I think they got a lot more interest than they expected because there were long lines and I didn't meet the pilots, but I did get to see the aircraft and uh, I know they were trying to involve the community and, 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 and open up. And so anyway, I thank them for sharing and, and involving the community. Um, I Let's see, what else? Oh, I wanted to thank um, Esther Kenyon. I went to a, a lovely, thank you, Esther. I went to a lovely uh, luncheon that she had uh, on uh, Sunday for, let me see if I can get the name right, Seal Beach Community Performing Arts Association. And she had the, uh, I'm not sure if I know the exact name, but the show choir from Los Alamitos High School came and performed with their director, David uh, Mullenkamp, and, who received an award from the association. And they are, were just fabulous. They performed for, gee, I don't know, 20, 30, I don't know, for, for quite a while. And they are having a holiday, sh a series of holiday shows coming up. I think it's the first weekend in December. Uh, you can probably Google, but they have tickets. And so anyway, they're, they're just amazing. And uh, I'm sure that you, if you're looking for something to do, you'd enjoy uh, going to see that and supporting them. Um, let's see. Um, I also attended um, a uh, Cyprus Women's Conference, uh, and, which I have the last couple years, but uh, one of the speakers there was Chief Warrant Officer Rochelle Sanza, and she uh, was there uh, t speaking about the sunburst, uh, um, let's see, academy. I'm trying to think of the second word in there, youth, Aca youth academy or Youth Challenge Academy, and uh, it was it was really great. She's a great speaker, and I think a lot of the women there don't even realize that the Sunburst Academy exists. And uh, it's a residential program for at-risk youth that have dropped out of school, and it's very structured. It's uh, you know getting the kids some structure and discipline in their life and uh, get them back on track. Uh, I, she, she did a great job, I think, uh, promoting the academy, but also kind of uh, just, just uh, the, uh, the presence of the military, just, just a wonderful job, you know, it, it, for herself and that, explaining her background, how she got into it and whatever. So I enjoyed that a lot. Um, I went, I also went to a regional military affairs meeting. I think it was maybe the meeting before last where they, they now have a, let's see if I can get this name right, um, a National Guard Youth Academy Challenge pro, um, Program that is is uh, goes a step farther that takes graduates from this program and gets them into trying to get them into a job. Uh, so it's also a residential program, five and a half months, and very structured. Same thing. The kids are up early, and they work. They're working with Cypress College or Long Beach City College, and the programs that they're 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 trying are needed programs. They're trying to get the kids into our automotive technology, automotive uh, cybersecurity, and um, construction. Kind of a, a pre-construction program that uh, that introduces them to the construction trades and hopefully gets them on the right foot. So anyway, all these programs that are, are very helpful in our community for the kids who aren't on the, <clears throat> the college track that maybe fall off and to try to get them back into being productive uh, citizens and uh, on their way. Let's see. And... 
I guess that's it. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Maslava. Mine's much shorter. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, I did go to uh, Vector Control, of course. That's a once a month meeting. And I think I admonished everyone at the last meeting to watch out for those mosquitoes. Well, you know, now we're cooling off a little bit. It won't be as dramatic, but West Nile virus is still very much with us. There are people every day coming down with West Nile virus in Orange County. So um, please pay attention to standing water. Uh, keep those mosquitoes not hatching. <laughs> and I did go to the sanitation district meeting. Um, they do what they do, you know, they buy stuff. <laughs> They pay for they pay for new equipment and uh, they pay for repairs and uh, they they pay a lot of money for these big technical equipment that they need to keep our water safe because what happens is they collect everything and all that water that comes along with the other stuff in the sewer gets treated and put back down into the aquifer, and we're drinking it. And we've been doing that for about 30 years, so we haven't died yet. So don't get upset about hearing something like that. Um, and that's about my two meetings. There was no Rivers and Mountains Conservancy this month or last month, and maybe not next month. But um, Rivers and Mountains Conservancy has uh, the interest of council member Kalmick and um, uh, we're going to try and make an effort to uh, get him appointed to that committee and whether he likes it or not. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, that's coming up in the city selection committee and um, if we put together a whole effort I think maybe we'll be successful in having two of us on the Rivers and Mountains Conservancy Board of Directors. And maybe two of us can get something done because I haven't been able to. So um, that's all I have. All right, thank you. Uh, just to clarify the water comment and the public comments, there, Las Amidos, he showed uh, the county slide where there was no chemical found in that water. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, I went to Edison Park cleanup a few weeks ago. I've uh, seen drastic improvements and overall people taking care of their gardens. And I thank you to Tim Kelsey for uh, managing this better. And there's only one person on the waiting list right now. So if someone wants to have a community garden, it's a good opportunity. Um, I know I went and I met a lot of uh, the residents from all over the city have gardens there. Uh, several of them live in Leisure World. Uh, the Leisure World waiting list is about five years with 250 people. So uh, it's a nice chance for residents in Leisure World to uh, come over to our garden and have a plot. Um, I attended a town hall meeting in Leisure World a few weeks ago that went very well. I'd like to thank the police department uh, for answering all the questions. Almost all the relative uh, residents I have spoken to look forward to having traffic enforcement in Leisure World. Uh, so thank you. Um, AES, there, there was last week I was informed by some residents in my district complaining about pollution from the AES power plant. I met with the concerned residents and I also met with AES pa uh, plant management. I've been assured that this portion of the startup phase where they do the blowouts is over. Uh, and as each phase is implemented, the plant becomes more environmentally safe. Uh, going forward, we'll have much better communication with AES and what is going on there. Um, I'm having meet, meet and greet on this Saturday at Edison Park and I've asked AES management to be there um, if you have any concerns, you're welcome to come to the meeting. It will be 
11 a.m. to 1 p.m. in Edison Park. And lastly, I attended the staff meeting uh, today, and I'd like to thank everyone that was there, and also thank the entire staff for all that you do. Um, I'd like to thank Mayor Pratem Sustarsik and Councilmember Kalmek and working together uh, to win the contest of building the highest structure with <laughs> spaghetti noodles to hold a marshmallow. <laughs> this is our <laughs> and uh, thanks, that's all that I have. Mayor, I had just had one quick item before we move on. David Spitz, if you could just come forward for a second. I want, to, want you to model your T-shirt real quick, so I'm not doing it. <laughs> So I forgot to mention, uh, several of us, um, there's usually a theme every year and the staff selects it and this year was wear a t-shirt of your favorite charity. It just so happens the Seal Beach Police Department has rolled out um, their Pink Patch Project t-shirts. Um, so several of us have those on, as you notice, we still have them on with jeans and it's just part of our day. Um, but really want to give a shout out um, to the chief as well as Dominic Sarabia. I know all of you know him. He's one of our senior CSOs in property evidence and parking. He's the one that's responsible. He designs these shirts. He does all the legwork for it. He promotes them. All the money goes to support breast cancer awareness. And so just want um, to give a shout out for our PD team for all the work that they do. And all of our staff team who bought shirts really just support the cause as well as some council members. And if anybody's interested, I know the police department still has them for sale, so. Thank you. And we'll move on to consent calendar. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? And we we'll use the uh, old voting system, please. Oh. Um, okay. I would move we um, approve the consent calendar. Second. All right, please vote. At five zero, motion carries. And then we'll move on to the public hearing. Um, item F, city manager, is there a staff report? Yes, Mayor, thank you. I'll turn this item over to our public works director, Steve Miter. Steve? Uh, thank you, uh, city manager Ingram. I am actually going to ask Iris, our Iris Lee, our city engineer, to actually uh, conduct the uh, public hearing. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, and uh, City Manager Ingram. The item before you tonight is a resolution to amend the city's uh, cost recovery schedule to include a wireless facility fee schedule. Earlier this year, um, in January of 2019, the city adopted Ordinance 1677 to include the wireless communication facility permit in the city's ordinance. Sorry, I'm a little bit tongue-tied right here. The um, Federal Communications um, Commission, FCC, pres prescribes application fees to process these applications or small wireless cell site permits. And it generally equates to one application for $500, which covers up to five sites. So in essence, if somebody wants to um, submit an application for five different locations, it'll all be covered under that $500 under one application. So the city has since received a number of applications and reviewed the process um, for these uh, new installations and conducted an analysis and which we found out that the processing of these permits far exceeds what FCC prescribes. FCC allows um, agencies to establish their own fee schedule as long as they're reasonable and non-discriminatory. So as such, the city recommends, or it is recommended that the city council adopts resolution 6963 tonight to establish our own wireless communication fees. In summary, what staff is recommending is to charge $100 per application for five sites, in addition to 1, 000, a minimum of $1,000 minimum review deposit per location. So for example, if somebody wants to do a new installation for one site, it would be $1,100. $100 for the application fee and $1,000 for the deposit. If it's two sites under one application, it will be $2,100 and so on up to five locations. 
Similar to other established plan track fee deposits in the city that we do have, um, the deposit covers time and material uh, required to process each of these permits. Should the final amount of these, uh, uh, should the final amount be less than the deposit, we will refund the balance to the applicant. And should the final amount be more than the deposit amount, the applicant will have to pay the difference before we issue the permit. This concludes my presentation and I'm open for questions. Any questions? Councilmember Vera Papa? Yeah, just, just one. I noticed that you had the um, FCC rate shown in the staff report, and then you have what the city's going to charge. Correct. And, and do, do they mirror each other or not necessarily? No. Um, in terms of the application, we decide to batch one application to cover up to five sites. So that kind of jibes with what FCC prescribes, but uh, the deposit component of it is unique in itself. And is there an annual fee too then? Is that there isn't an annual fee. So um, what FCC prescribes is an uh, annual fee for maintenance of city infrastructure and public right of way. Majority of these small cell installations take place on streetlight poles and joint utility poles, which are not owned by the city. There are few fewer opportunities that are on the city right of way. So uh, staff therefore recommends to not establish a separate fee that would not be uh, often used. Um, instead, we're requesting that applicants and users uh, to actually apply for um, a very quick turnaround encroachment permit for each time they decide to maintain those sites. Is there a fee associated with that then? There is a fee and it is already established in our current fee schedule. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. We open the public hearing. Is there any comments from the public for, on this one? Okay, we'll close the public hearing and move to item G. Oh. See, manager, is there a staff report? If we could get a vote, yeah. I'm sorry, please, of, is there a motion to uh, vote on item F? Move. Second. Okay, please vote. Okay, 5 0. Motion carries. Item G, C manager, is there a staff report? Yes, Mayor, thank you. I'm gonna turn this item over to Vicki Beatley, our Director of Finance. Um, also wanna recognize uh, Lee Rencon, who's the Chief Financial Officer for Energy Tubulars, who's in the audience as well tonight um, in support of this item in, in the event uh, the council has any questions um, on Energy Tubulars' behalf. Vicki? Thank you, City Manager Ingram, Mayor, members of the Council. Tonight you have before you consideration of Amendment Number 4 to the Agreement for Energy Tubulars, and we are asking that the City Council hold a public hearing regarding the amendment to the economic development subsidy between the City of Seal Beach and Energy Tubulars. A little bit of background, Energy Tubulars sells and distributes tubular goods in the petroleum, natural gas, and geothermal industries. And the Energy Tubulars has actually, the agreement with Energy Tubulars has actually been in place since 2007. And they originally moved here, there was an expectation that they would have six employees and that they would generate a certain amount of business. And certainly when they first moved here in 2007, the uh, price of oil and the production of oil well drilling was significantly higher than it has been in the past couple of years. But in any case, we're asking for the uh, council to consider continuing the agreement at the current 20% level. A little bit more of the background is that the primary stipulation of this agreement is that ETI's commitment to Seal Beach location, and to date there have actually been three amendments to this agreement. As I mentioned earlier, we're asking you to consider the fourth agreement. The current agreement expires in October 31st of this uh, month, actually 2019. Since, and the most significant change, and I think the last time the council considered this agreement, was a legislative requirement to hold an open and public hearing process for any sort of what were called revenue sharing, now called economic development subsidies. And so a little bit about the, the legislation, there's actually requirements in the legislation for something called a report. 
and the report has to list the name and address of all the corporations, the start and end dates of the schedule, of any schedules if applicable, a description of the economic development subsidy, including the estimated totals of the expenditures of public funds or revenue that may be lost, a statement to the uh, public purpose for the economic development subsidy, and projected tax revenue to the local agency as a result of the economic development subsidy. I'd like to highlight for the city council the attachment to the staff report, which is uh, called Economic Development Subsidy Report, and it is per government code section 53083. And that report is required, that report uh, we uh, printed the public hearing as required per the legislation, and when the public hearing notice came into the paper on October 3rd, this economic development subsidy report was available with the city clerk's office for anybody to take a look at, and it lays out sort of the historical information with regard to this relationship, and not just from 2013, but actually from all the way back to the beginning of the relationship with energy tubulars. Excuse me. One of the things that I'd also like to highlight, it, it makes it a, a little bit challenging for us, and we have to be careful about the information that we put out there, but uh, sales tax information generally is protected by law, and so when in preparing this second version of this report, what we were attempting to do in the information that we were presenting to you was provide sort of round numbers, generic numbers that wouldn't specifically speak to the amount of revenue that has been particularly generated. And one of the things that we also have to keep in mind is that this is a five-year agreement that begins now and sort of looks forward until 2024 if the council adopts this agreement. And who knows what the price of oil is going to be, who knows what the production is going to be, and who knows what the sales volume for energy tubulars is going to be. So it's sort of our best guess at looking at the history, um, looking at what it was, and then setting some parameters potentially that we might expect to see with a, a significant level of unknowns. The one caveat when we look at this also is past performance doesn't guarantee future performance as well. So trying to put all sorts of squishy information into a document that projects out for a five-year period. And as Jill mentioned, Mr. Rincon is here to uh, answer any questions that uh, council may have. And one of the things that I would actually like to point out in the report is I mentioned earlier when energy tubulars first came into town, they were expecting to have six positions that they were going to generate in our community because of this particular siding of, of their offices into the city of Seal Beach. And as it turns out, there's 16 full-time positions that have been generated at that location and one part-time position as well. So well beyond our expectations for the number of employees in the community. And again, with the fluctuation in oil, you know, there's been significantly high years and there's been significantly low years. And uh, just sort of generally speaking, you know, there's several hundred dollars that we've at, that we've paid them in economic development subsidy, and there's, uh, you know, tens of thousands of dollars that we paid them. And so it just, it really, there is no way for us to know what it's going to look like. We're just saying on average, based upon the number of years we have, this is the information that we have to present to you. And with that, my presentation is concluded, and I am happy to answer any questions. Um, Mr. Mayor, at this time I'm going to recuse myself as I had a previous relationship with the owners of Energy Tubulars. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Got your phone? Wait. Wait a minute. Council member Vera Papa. Um, so is that where the one million dollar estimated tax revenue came from? Because you were looking at I mean it says average, but right. is that not an accurate Well it's per se, it, or? it's a range. It's a so range. it has been as high as about a million dollars and it has been significantly lower than that. And because we just don't know where it's gonna be over the next five years, I'm providing both a high estimate. 
Is that the extreme high or the? Mm -hmm. Yes, that is that is the extreme high. Uh -huh. So it wouldn't be an average per se then. Darn. Uh, uh, well, not per se, no, but likely. I mean, depending on where the price of oil goes, and and depending on where the um, volume of sales go for the business. And in the staff report, it says it's not. Um, uh, item is not applicable to measure BB. Is that necessarily true, or are they, are they taxed per BB, or how? Well, that? in the staff report, the section that says applicable for BB is used for us to connect the item potential, you know, specifically to measure BB. So this doesn't have anything to do with measure BB. However, every business in the city of Seal Beach was required to implement Measure BB, which is 8.75% on April 1st, 2019. So they are a participant in that Measure BB to that extent. Thank you. Other questions? So does the 20% affect the, the uh, BB? Can you speak up a little bit? Oh, sorry. Does the 20% then also affect the BB revenue? It, any sales that Energy Tubulars does is required to collect the 8.75%. So their revenue share would actually go up because there's more tax being collected based upon the sales that they're doing. Okay, so we will be getting more from them. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Well, it's pretty clear. Okay. We'll open the public hearing. Any comments? All right, we'll close the public hearing. And is there a motion? I'll move the item. Second. Please vote. Motion carries four to zero. Yeah, there's no unfinished business, no new business. And we'll go ahead and adjourn the city council meeting to Monday, October 28th, 2019 at 5.30 p.m. to meet in closed session if deemed necessary. Thank you.